Welcome everyone to 2021's GraphQL Com State of GraphQL keynote panel. I am extremely excited to be joined by a number of amazing speakers who will be sharing their insight about this rapidly evolving ecosystem. Their experience spans engineering, education, and product. Before we get started with the meat of the questions, I'd love to kick things off and have the folks introduce themselves and share more about how they got familiar with GraphQL. Eve, would you like to get started? Sure. Hey, everybody. My name is Eve Porcello. I work at Moon Highway. We're a JavaScript and GraphQL and React training company in Northern California. So I really got started with GraphQL because everyone was asking me, how do we use this awesome thing, GraphQL, at our company? And I didn't have an answer for them. So I wanted to go find that out. And since then, we've been working with GraphQL really heavily, and we love it on all of our projects. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Eve. Well, maybe I'll go next then. Hey, hey, everyone. This is Michael. I'm the CEO and co-founder of GraphCMS. Uh, we offer a GraphQL native headless content management platform. Uh, so we're heavily invested into GraphQL. And uh, I discovered GraphQL for the first time end of 2015, uh, where the, the hype was going around on uh, numerous medium posts, and there was just too much buzz going around to to uh, to to not to not figure it out what it is and to try it out. And uh, I did early on, and uh, I fell in love with the technology. And uh, so, at a later point, we decided to build a whole product on top of it. Lori. Hey everyone, um, I'm Lori Barth and I am a senior software engineer at Netflix. I got involved with GraphQL um, as part of using Gatsby, actually, back when I made my personal site. And then I actually worked at Gatsby uh, using GraphQL, and now I'm at Netflix and we use GraphQL there as well, albeit in a very different way uh, than, when, than I did when building a front-end framework. So uh, it's been fun. I feel like I've spanned a lot of different experiences with GraphQL, and it's a really powerful uh, technology that I've enjoyed working with. All right, and I believe I'm last. Um, I'm Kelly Gage. I'm CPO of Commerce Tools. Um, I was first introduced to, com to GraphQL when I joined Commerce Tools in 2016. I'd been hearing a lot about Sangria, which was a side project of one of our developers, and we were early adopters of GraphQL. Um, so I learned about it. I, I really liked it. And later in 2019, I wrote GraphQL for Modern Commerce for O'Reilly, uh, exploring the intersection of GraphQL and commerce. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all of your first experiences. To kick things off, GraphQL has been around for a number of years now, and it's continued to mature and evolve. Um, when looking today at how developers and companies are using GraphQL as compared to before when it first came out, what would stand out for you as the biggest change? Lori, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, so it's interesting. I think when I first learned about GraphQL, I sort of made an assumption that it used a graph database, which is not at all true. Um, and so I think it's evolved to become a really popular contract for your API layer. It can um, make this really nice middle layer that uh, is it doesn't matter what your front end is. It doesn't matter what your back end is. You can change either of them irrespective of each other. And you have this nice schema um, for how you're going to interact with your back end. Um, and, and I think one of the biggest changes in the evolution is to be able to use GraphQL at scale, because part of the bonus of GraphQL is that you don't need to know exactly what each of your calls is going to, what kind of data it's going to need. Um, when you first design it, that can evolve over time. You can add more fields to objects, all of these things. But when you do that at scale, you end up with these really, really unyielding schemas that are like impossible to make sense of. You have these huge, huge backends that control everything at your company. Um, so we've moved forward in that respect, being able to split up your schemas, the idea of federation, which I know we'll probably talk about later on. Um, so seeing, seeing that evolution has been interesting, both in how people understand it in the larger community and the use cases that it can support while still keeping its core benefits. 
I completely agree on that. So this is also something that uh, we have observed over at Graph CMS. Well, earlier in the early years of GraphQL, actually people would build GraphQL APIs for a single service, but then over the years you could you could actually observe how people would use GraphQL to actually uh, build a universal API to connect to multiple microservices, not just to one service in the backend. And this is really what we're obso observing in the market. And uh, it's great to see that there seems to be this now generic contract for multiple services of your complete stack. Awesome, very, very cool. Uh, Lori, you mentioned uh, GraphQL at scale and in production. So something that a lot of companies are now, uh, sorry, okay, please delete this. Um, you talked about GraphQL at scale and in production, something that we're seeing in a lot of companies today. Kelly, do you have some experiences that you'd like to share about kind of the evolution that you've seen in companies using GraphQL? Sure. We first launched GraphQL support in 2016 at Commerce Tools, and we didn't have a single customer use it for two years. <laughs> um, intellectually and technically, it was quite a beautiful approach, but the market really wasn't there yet. And I think that's in part because the commerce market was very oriented around these big suites from mega vendors that did a little bit of everything. So you don't really need GraphQL in that case necessarily. But the market really shifted um, towards what Gartner is calling composable commerce, which is you've got best of breed vendors out there doing um, each one thing and one thing really well. And that's resulted in organizations completely changing how they buy software and how they integrate everything together. So it doesn't make sense if you're building like a product detail page to call out to five different vendors and then you know three different APIs within each of those, those vendors. It gets pretty unwieldy pretty quickly. And REST is, has a lot of, uh, it's great, but it has a lot of issues. Um, so now we're at a point where at least 75% of our customers are using GraphQL. And our customers include like lego.com, um, um, AT&T.com, Ulta Beauty, um, you know, bigger enterprise. I mean, some of these organizations, I, I, I dare say, are even big, boring, you know, Midwestern companies. And they're Don't all- Don't you dare call saying, Lego boring, Kelly. <laughs> Actually, Lego is, <laughs> Lego is the, is, was one of the very, very first enterprises oh, to goodness. adopt GraphQL in our, our world. So Lego is actually on the very bleeding edge, but I'm saying like, there are lots of big boring retailers out there that you know, are still running COBOL on the back end, And now they're saying to us, yes, we are using GraphQL. It's a done deal. This is not even up for discussion anymore. And I think over time, if I look forward, I think nearly hundred percent of our customers are gonna be using GraphQL pretty soon. So it's great to see that it's really widely adopted. I'd like to add one comment to this. Um, two years ago, I was really happy to see uh, when we were uh, approaching cu a customer and when, when we uh, teamed up, actually, when we closed a customer uh, from the German market, they're uh, Germany's oldest company. They're 500 years old. And it was great to see that already two years ago, there was such an, uh, let's say, uh, legacy company adopting uh, such modern technology. And uh, across the board in all the verticals, we see GraphQL adoption nowadays. So not just e-commerce uh, and, and media, it's, it's all around, it's even used in governments. Uh, so it's great to see the adoption and uh, I think it's, it's still growing very fast. Amazing. With all that growth and all those companies adopting GraphQL, I wonder if there are certain challenges that kind of show up in many different organizations or among developer teams. Eve, have you seen any kinds of questions that come up repeatedly when people are trying to figure out if GraphQL is right for them? Yeah, totally. I think it's a huge communication shift overall for people. There's this feeling like, oh, we just moved to React and Redux and how are we going to change something else again? Like, how do we change everything? We, do, we have to tear down all our REST APIs to get started with this. And as Lori said, like, do we have to use a graph database? Like, there's all these misconceptions about GraphQL that you kind of have to overcome first in order to use it. And I think that's becoming easier as more and more big companies adopt GraphQL. But that communication thing is huge. Um, also, 
also, I would say schema management and governance, they call it, which always sounds funny to me because it sounds so official, but it's a good word for it. Um, schema governance and who sits on the committee that gets to update the schema and like what goes in the schema, how do we iterate on a schema, all of that becomes kind of complicated as you go along. So there's a lot of great tools like Apollo Studio and others for managing that, but it kind of really depends on the company, I think, about who, who gets to be the shadowy body that gets to make those changes. Definitely. Lori, you've seen GraphQL in use in a number of different companies. Have you kind of seen these questions arise? Are there similarities, contrasts? Um, I've certainly heard those questions. I think the places I've used GraphQL are maybe a little unique amongst GraphQL um, users. I, I, so first of all, when I was at Gatsby, we were building GraphQL as a pattern and a sort of middle layer for all of these different data sources, which is just a very unique way. You're almost like setting up GraphQL to do the work without writing GraphQL itself. We were writing queries and resolvers, but in like a very unique sort of esoteric way. So Gatsby is just like a very unique use case for GraphQL that other frameworks have adopted for sure. And that I'm sure Kelly would have some experience with working on the e-commerce side of things, some similar patterns there. Um, but that's very, very different than, you know, using it in a live application. Um, Using it in a live application, definitely sort of aligning on the schema is, is a challenge and figuring out who's in charge of making those decisions and what a breaking change looks like. Um, I will say like at Deprecated and some of those other helpers that people have started to adopt is a huge win in being able to migrate from um, schemas that existed before that introduced breaking changes, which is important in situations where you're working with a lot of different consumers and providers. Um, I think the big problems that I've seen or challenges that we're all still working through as a community is around the client and all of the different choices that the client has to make that you don't necessarily have to worry about in REST. So there's obviously always caching in REST, but a cache policy for GraphQL is particularly important because of the way that mutations and queries work. Um, looking at an error handling use case, looking at how you want to run refetches, um, to make sure there's no stale data on the page. Like all of those things are sort of unique challenges just because of the way GraphQL works. And we have patterns for them, but some of them can be a little bit verbose. Um, and so aligning on, on what that's going to look like, I think we're going to see a lot of evolution there in the next two to three years. Um, you know, Eve mentioned Apollo Studio, all of those OSS tools definitely doing a lot of heavy lifting, but I know, I don't think anyone's really like a hundred percent on this is the solution. There's sort of like four solutions for a bunch of different things. And you you try different things, but no one's like super happy with them. So um, I think client consumption and uh, dealing with mutation side effects is going to be a, a challenge that we see get addressed in a more robust way in the next two to three years. Yeah. And you already touched upon the, the patterns that are already there but it takes time to actually discover and develop those patterns. So GraphQL is still a young technology. So I think that is one of the key challenges still for, uh, for businesses out there to figure things out. The learning curve, uh, it, it's quite steep, so it's complex to get started. And GraphQL is hard on the backend side of things. So it's, there's where the complexity is. This is where you need really a lot of time to learn and understand things because you can break a lot on the backend you can you can build in recursions and uh, you can uh, build very important performant backends and you have to be very careful. They have to be designed with care. And in order to design something with care, you need to know the patterns. You need to know how it's done. GraphQL, GraphQL is really great on the front end side of things. To consume a GraphQL API is super fun. This is where people are like, wow, this looks cool. This is nice. I want to have that. But when they realize I have to build the back end for this also, then it takes a bit of time. And uh, the ecosystem is evolving. And a great uh, set of tooling is also being built. So this, it just takes time to develop those patterns, but also the tools that may, will make the back end development uh, more easier, uh, much more easier. And uh, with that, more adoption will follow, actually. 
I think that's hilarious because I would say literally the opposite. I think it's harder <laughs> to be the client than the back end. Um, <laughs> why so? Why, why so? <laughs> I think it's harder to be the client than the back end because the back end is no longer beholden to every time the client's uh, requirements change. So they get to a lot more bandwidth in making choices. And the client now has all of these new considerations that the back end used to handle, but the client is now in charge of because of the way that the information is being served. And that's not a bad thing, right? Like it's a good thing. It's making improvements, but it's shifting even more sort of hard engineering problems to the client that have previously lived in either a middle layer or entirely in the back end. In the right. Past. Right, right. Uh, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, I agree on this, but I mean, when you approach GraphQL for the first time, you see it at the first time, it's definitely much more easier to digest how to consume a GraphQL API on the front end side than build uh, the, the back end implementation for it. Yeah, that, that was the point <laughs> I was making. It's all hard. <laughs> we came to the conclusion. <laughs> no, but I, I, right, I think that's the point. And it wasn't saying that like Michael's, yeah. Michael's take is wrong. Um, it, yeah. It's not. It's that, you know, depending on what your project is, it's going to vary in, incredibly so. Um, yeah. And, and it, depending on who you are too, right? Like <laughs> if all I do every day is write Node.js resolvers, then maybe it's not so bad. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the thing we're getting at is that GraphQL touches so many layers of the stack and affects so many different people on the team. So it's going to be fun to see how like best practices, whatever that means. I know those become obsolete in minutes yeah. these days, but um, how those will evolve over the next few years. Totally. Definitely. It kind of brings me, uh, it kind of makes me think and wonder, Kelly, maybe you have an insight here with the additional best practices, as Eve said, with the additional resources and, and conferences and things happening, do you feel like these challenges of, you know, how to set up GraphQL on the front end, on the back end, that companies feel more willing to take these on because they've kind of seen others already kind of set the path there? Yes, but there needs to be a lot more commercial support for both server-side implementations and client-side implementations as well. Um, for example, schema federation is still really, really difficult to do. And if you look at one of our customers, they're having a commerce platform, they're getting a content management system, they might get a DAM of some sort, they might have a PIM. Um, they might have a search platform. You know, they, they have all of these services that they're buying. And everyone raises their hand and says, yeah, we, we've got a, you know, we've got GraphQL, um, but now you end up with the same problem that you're trying to solve, which is you've now got six different GraphQL endpoints that you've got to merge. And yeah, I mean, it's certainly getting better. Apollo is making progress, but I, you know, they're focusing a little bit more on enterprise integrations and, you know, I, I don't think there are a lot of vendors out there really innovating anymore in the plain GraphQL space itself. They're looking at ways of getting companies to pay for things, which is great. You know, I understand it, right? You, you've got to eat. But at the same time, if there was a magic way to merge these schemas together or self-caching at scale or some of these other issues, I think we would see even more widespread GraphQL adoption than there is because it's still pretty complicated. Like if I look at my network, you know, I, I know exactly two people who could who I would recommend to anyone who would want to join together a whole bunch of GraphQL endpoints, you know, and I think there needs to be more people out there and better tooling. Federation is hard. <laughs> Should we talk about Federation really quickly? Cause I feel like it was something that I had no knowledge of when I was working on a single application. Um, and Absolutely. I only realized, we should. yeah, so, so the, the like quick, uh, flying by the seat of my pants explanation of federation is you can have um, resolvers in multiple different backends and you can have a single sort of like load balancer, practically it's not a load balancer, but like a single front door um, that can delegate and say, okay, I'm querying this item here and three of these fields are then going to get sent to this other set of resolvers with this additional context and information it needs in order to resolve that. So it's like delegating queries, not necessarily from a paralyzation standpoint, but from a different sources of truth for information standpoint. How'd I do? What do we think? 
You're doing um, pretty good. <laughs> but you can also get different types from different places as well. So, you know, let's let's look at lego.com, one of our customers, right? They have a product detail page. And if you pull up that page, that's a very complicated page, right? You've got product content data from us. You have inventory data from us. You have pricing data from us. But you also have a lot of content, right? There's a lot of rich media there as well. Um it, there's a whole bunch, there's search information there. You know, a lot of that's driven, the personalization on that page is driven through search. So it's not just fields, um, it's it's actual entire types that are that need to be retrieved from different sources. And what somebody wants to be able to do, a developer building out something like that is to say, you know, for this uh, page or for this product, you know, these are all of the different um, things I need to render that. And some of that might be content, some of it might be commerce, some of it might be search results. You know, it, it gets very complicated very quickly and that data is scattered everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, the fields is the simplified answer for sure. But, yeah. but, but the, the non-real world. But the great thing is if you do the investment of building your federated architecture and federated graph, you can only issue a single API call fetching all of that data really with one mm -hmm. call. And uh, that's just, it's a mass massive productivity boost for developers not to have to deal with all of those different APIs. Uh, if you know there's like, only one gateway, one API that is secured, that is hosted, that is cached, and uh, you can just keep going and developing your application. You don't have to worry about what is going on underneath. It's an upfront investment, but uh, we have seen a lot of cases where it was worth it. Yeah, and that's the thing. We always tell our customers, it's a very clear trade-off, right? You are optimized, with GraphQL, you are 100% optimizing for client-side development. <laughs> And if you've got a bunch of really complicated clients, even though there might be some complexity introduced with GraphQL, it's totally worth it because clients evolve, need to evolve a lot faster than the backends do. Awesome. Um, Michael, you spoke somewhat to, you spoke to about your experience. I'm wondering if you can give some additional insights about maybe any use cases or observations or kind of best practices lessons learned from what you've seen at GraphCMS or maybe from people using GraphCMS? As already uh, mentioned uh, earlier, we've seen wide adoption by all of the different verticals. Uh, so really uh, any, uh, any GraphCMS user, GraphQL uh, user, community user, what they're building, is, is, it's, it's almost no surprise anymore. It's like uh, it's, it's media companies, it's digital product companies. Uh, video on demand streaming platforms being built. Um, government, we have the US Quidditch organization also using GraphQL by now. So really there's almost almost no place where, where you wouldn't find GraphQL in the stack. Wow, and, that's uh, a game changer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and really it's uh, fantastic to see that uh, or, or looking at GraphQL, uh, like we, we don't, usually a lot of apps or websites or digital content is not being served anymore to one website. It's being served to mobile applications, smart TVs, uh, other touch points. And GraphQL really helps shaping or giving those touch points uh, the data they need easily. Definitely. Eve, having kind of seen so many different companies working with GraphQL, do you have any kind of best practices or lessons learned that, that you can share as well? Oh, man. Uh, I would say best practices wise, um, some of the early kind of training sessions we did with folks, there was this dedicated fan group of GraphQL, maybe four or five people that loved GraphQL so much. And all they wanted was for GraphQL to be adopted by their organization in general. And they had a tendency to get so excited about all of their advanced, critical enterprise performance challenges that it just like completely overwhelms people who are just getting introduced to this stuff. So I would say you can, first of all, introduce people to GraphQL really incrementally, like in a friendly way to bring everybody on board, but also roll out GraphQL incrementally too. You don't have to, as I said, destroy everything that you're currently working with. There are lots of 
uh, companies who have had great success wrapping REST endpoints as a starting point and then kind of evolving from there to make their kind of platform APIs a little bit more performant. So I would say just, t even though it's exciting to get involved in GraphQL, like take it slow, bring everybody along with you and you're gonna have a much better time. <laughs> Speaking of people's kind of love for GraphQL or pet kind of tech preferences, uh, what are some of your favorite GraphQL tools that you're seeing nowadays? Um, Lori. Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, I've been using a lot of Apollo stuff recently, specifically on the client side. Um, our backend is actually Java with GraphQL, which people don't think is a possibility. It absolutely is. Um, but that means the tooling we use in that space is maybe a little bit different uh, than what people would see in the wild. Um, I will also say that all of the GraphQL tooling that exists in IDEs is really helpful. There's like a GraphQL uh, plugin for IntelliJ. There's a plugin for VS Code that just makes reading schemas a lot easier. Also just graphical, like whatever your implementation is that's giving you graphical, it is your best friend at any given point in time when you're running the back end locally, when you're running the front end locally, when you're trying to debug things in, promote, in production, graphical is your best friend. <laughs> We're all so lucky to have graphical, right? Seriously, and I don't think I would die. people would like GraphQL at all without it, I feel like, because- It's the much uh, yeah. better version <laughs> yeah, of Postman. I agree. Yeah. Much better sure. version of Postman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another voter for graphical as well. Yeah. Here. <laughs> it's, it's, the perfect, it's the perfect tool to just show someone GraphQL. You open up graphical or GraphQL Playground. Mm -hmm. uh, you open up an API and you start writing uh, those queries. You start with very simple queries. You explain them the magic behind GraphQL. Oh, this is how it looks like. You hit command space, you get code completion. You have more fields. Then you add some filtering. There's some sorting there. And wow, this, uh, like people say that people that don't know GraphQL, they really say, oh, wow, that's really cool. I want to have this also. Uh, and it, it really, it's, it's a fantastic tool that helped the adoption of GraphQL. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Oldie but goodie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Classic. The old classic. We're waiting, we're waiting for the next big major release. <laughs> Are there any other tools that kind of catch people's imagination that you've seen nowadays? I'm kind of excited to see um, what Apollo is going to come out with. Um, they raised their $130 million Series D round, and that puts them at a mind-boggling billion and a half uh, valuation, which is pretty remarkable. They just announced today, right? Yeah. Yep. Wow. yeah. It's a great testimony. And, uh, yeah, and I think it's a lot of validation um, for the space, which is great. And with that, they plan on spending almost all of it on hiring developers and innovating and building out their product. So I, I can't even imagine what they could come up with. Uh, I could give them a list, but <laughs> I think um, people way smarter than me will come up with some really cool GraphQL features that will further promote its adoption out in the industry. I just awesome. thought of two more things that I can... Uh mention really quick. One is uh, all of the code gen based on GraphQL schemas for TypeScript clutch. Um, <laughs> and even if you're not using TypeScript and you're just trying to look at uh, like queries and mutations and look at their signature, super awesome. Um, and then the GQL template tag, Lifesaver, um, and finally, just the GraphQL package, the thing that you, the things you can do with that, like you can do straight up AST parsing in GraphQL with that package. There's a parse and a print. I've done it before. It's awesome. I could I built a code mod that modifies GraphQL queries. So like, there's really cool stuff out there. Um, and yeah, just go and play around with some things because it's cool. <laughs> Amazing. Just to round out the conversation, where do folks see GraphQL moving forward? Michael, do you want to kick us off? Oh, I would love to see GraphQL in every stack out there and I would love to see much more simplified APIs in the future that are more powerful by adding federation to the stack so that uh, you have all the information like you want to build a very complex application or a new application and you have uh, a wonderful API to use all of the data, all of the services in the back end you, uh, you wish for without the pain of integrating all of those one by one. So I would love to see 
uh, sort of a marketplace for APIs where you uh, pick and select your favorite APIs and boom, you get a, uh, as a result, you get a unified universal GraphQL API for those services that you can just use. That would be fantastic. <laughs> I'm really excited about the differ and stream directives for loading data more incrementally. I think it's really exciting to think about like, instead of this huge response of data, breaking that down into smaller chunks over streams and things like that. So there's a lot of cool potential for those um, kind of interfaces that we use all the time to just become easier to use and better for front end developers. And I guess every developer really. Plus one to that and uh, some changes to error handling, which are mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, with that, thank you so much for everyone's time and for the lively conversation. And from all of us, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.